Good morning, everyone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. We are glad you are here to worship God with us. I am Suhail Morris, and I serve as an elder on the Discipleship Commission here, and I'll be helping to lead us in worship this morning. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship? which you can find up on the screen or on page one of your bulletin. Praise the Lord, all you nations. For great is God's steadfast love toward us. Let us remain standing and sing together. Some things in life are mysterious. They are hard to understand. But the Bible is clear 
about what God wants from us and what pleases God, the prophet Micah sums it up this way, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And when we use Micah's words as our standard, it's clear that our lives fall short. But fortunately, we are not without hope. In Jesus Christ, God promises to forgive us and by the Holy Spirit to empower us to live lives of justice, love, and mercy. And so using our prayer of confession, together let's ask for God's forgiveness and for God's empowerment to live lives that pleases God and bring glory to his name. Loving God, we confess that we have known what you ask of us and we have not done it. We have not loved you with our words or actions. Forgive us and by your Holy Spirit, inspire us with renewed conviction to do justice love kindness and walk humbly with you. We ask these things in the name of Christ Jesus, your living star and the light of the world. Amen. Take a moment now to make this prayer your own in a time of silent confession. Now hear these words of assurance from the book of Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. Beloved, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Because we are a forgiven people, we are a joyful people. Let's share our joy and greet one another. Once again, good morning and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Hampton Square. We are so glad that you joined us for worship this morning, especially if this is one of your first times with us. We are really glad you're here. In the middle of your bulletin, you can find a few announcements about what's going on in here in our congregation. There are just a few things that I'd like to call your attention to. Of course, you'll notice Pastor Kyle is not here. 
And he's on vacation, so he'll be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, he'll be in the office. Uh, this morning, we are excited to have the Reverend Dr. Andrew Scales preaching and celebrating the sacrament of Lord's Supper. <laughs> Pastor Andrew serves as a campus minister and as an executive co-director of Presbyterian of Princeton Presbyterians, a Presbyterian campus ministry at Princeton University. Uh, we are glad you're here. Welcome, Pastor Andrew. Uh, today, following worship in room 251, from 11.15 to 12.30, we'll have Sunday school for children in pre-K through fifth grade. Uh, even if this would be their first week, we invite your child to come and enjoy faith, fun, and uh, friends with us. Uh, now, speaking of Sunday school, next Sunday, and that is November 10th, from 11.15 to 12.30 in the youth room, we will be beginning a new Sunday school class for youth in 6th through 12th grades. It will meet every other week, and uh, we'll be covering a different topic each session. Our first session will be, what are you thankful for? And uh, we'll be digging deeper into scripture and our faith as we discuss what the Bible says we should be thankful for. We invite you to join us uh, for this new class. And uh, finally, don't forget, this Tuesday, we'll be having our annual election day lasagna dinner. And it seems we're a bit of a crisis. We are running low on desserts for the lasagna dinner. <laughs> so please sign up downstairs if you are able to bring in some desserts, you can find more information on the insert in your bulletin. Just like last year, it will be takeout only. Uh, you can purchase tickets after worship at the table in Swayze Hall. And uh, now I, invite, I want to invite Nicolette Beers to come up and share the children's moment with our youngest members. And uh, I also invite, want to invite the kids to come up. Hi, friends. How are we doing today? Exhausted. All right. Me too. <laughs> Do you guys notice anything different about today? Well, yeah, the time change. That's true. Um, I was thinking more like Pastor Kyle is in here today, right? We have a guest pastor today. We have Pastor Andrew, right? Um, I want to talk to you about new people and how we can welcome them into our lives. Okay, so have you guys ever been a new person in a new place and you didn't know the other kids? Yeah, how did that make you feel? Maybe a little bit scared, right? Maybe a little bit unsure, like you weren't sure what to do or how to make friends. Sometimes new people come into our lives and we have to welcome them with open hearts and kindness. In the Bible, Jesus welcomed everyone, no matter where they were from or what they were like, Jesus loved everyone equally. He especially loved those who felt left out and those who were new, okay? So, how can we make people feel welcome? By saying hello, that's a good one, yes. Showing them around, yeah, that's a great one. Maybe giving them a smile, right? And letting them join in our games and our, um, our worship like we're doing today. And playing with them, that's a really great one, yeah. 
So today, I want to make sure that we're welcoming Pastor Andrew, and if we go into our lives and we see anyone new, that we're welcoming them with open arms, okay? Let's go ahead and say a prayer. Can you repeat after me? Say, Dear God, thank you for all the wonderful new people we have in our lives, and help us to welcome them with open hearts. Amen. All right. Let's go back to your seats. Thank you, Nikki, for the beautiful message. Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, Psalm 146. Listen now for God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Uh, now I invite you to stand and let us sing together.
please be seated. Before we come to you this morning's gospel lesson, I just want to say it is such a joy to be with you this Sunday morning. Uh, as a Presbyterian campus minister, I believe that we are stronger together when we know one another, when we know each other as neighbors and we love each other. And it's really special to look out and see faces that I've met before through Presbytery work uh, and faces that I'm meeting for the first time today. So thank you so much for the warm welcome here at Hamilton Square. Let's turn to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us through your word today that we might know Christ and his good news for the entire world. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Hear now the word of the Lord. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After this, no one dared ask him any question. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of this morning's sermon is God and Neighbor. God and Neighbor. If you're looking for me on a weekday, a good bet is that I am sitting in Small World Coffee on Witherspoon Street in Princeton. One of the most fun and meaningful things that I get to do as a campus minister is meet one-on-one -on -one with young people. You may be able to guess a lot of what my wife and fellow chaplain Lena and I talk about with fellow students. If it's midterms week, they tell us all about their stressful papers and exams. Sometimes we hear about a nasty breakup or their excitement at the beginning of a new relationship. We celebrate with them when an audition for a play works out or they get a new job. It's a privilege to be a part of young people's lives when they share about the hard and the exciting things that they're going through. Underneath the whitewater rapids of a college semester, the exams, the homesickness, the roommate drama, young people are asking deep questions. Sometimes the glass of iced coffee that I always get is almost empty and I'm glancing at my phone to make sure I don't miss my next meeting and there's a pause. The student across the table fidgets a little bit and they hem and they haw, and then we come to something that they really wanted to talk about. Questions like, what does it look like to live a meaningful life? How will I find a way to belong in a new city, maybe even a new country after graduation? Where is God when I feel alone? Whenever a student brings up these kinds of questions, I feel hopeful. Amid all the demands to perform academically and achieve and succeed, these young people are taking a moment to pause and ask what's most important in life. They study all kinds of things, engineering, history, finance, poetry, religion, chemistry, but deep down, they share the same human concern. They want to find a way to make a positive impact on their community. They want to become people who are generous or compassionate, inspired by others. They want to love and to be loved. <clears throat> All of us bring our own perspectives when we read the stories of the Bible. 
And I hope you'll indulge me for a moment if I read this morning's story from the Gospel of Mark from the perspective of a campus minister. Jesus and his disciples have come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, but we, the readers, know that this will end up being the last week of his life. Jesus does what in his day were wild and provocative things, like turning over tables and driving out money changers from the temple. Everywhere he turns, it seems like he is getting into an argument with a Sadducee, a Pharisee, or a chief priest about the hot topics in theology and politics, like, is the resurrection real, or should we pay taxes to Caesar? But then we have this moment dropped in right into these episodes where Jesus doesn't argue at all. A scribe, somebody who has devoted his entire life to studying Torah, God's law, comes up to Jesus and asks him, what's most important? The Jewish scriptures are full of laws, things that you should do to honor God, things you should avoid to keep from sinning against God and others. And behind those specific questions about how one worships God in the temple or treats others fairly, there is a deeper question. Jewish thinkers from all over the world have come to Jerusalem for this holiday and brought with them the question, what does it mean to live a good life? Maybe this scribe who sees Jesus teaching and debating feels like a student who has heard a lecture that has blown her mind and she's trying to put things back together again and she just wants to talk to somebody about it and excited, a little bit confused, trying to put those thoughts back together, she comes to Jesus and asks to hang out at whatever the first century equivalent of small world coffee is. (laughs) Sitting together, the scribe asks Jesus, of all of the commandments in scripture, which is the most important? Which one should influence all the others? Jesus says that the most important thing is love. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's that simple and it's that complicated. The scribe agrees and repeats what Jesus just said. Love God and love your neighbor. In fact, it's more important than any kind of sacrifice or offering you can make. And Jesus again kind of oddly says, yeah, you're right. And then this cryptic saying, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Amid the escalating conflict between Jesus and other religious leaders, the hopes of the crowds that he might be the Messiah, the threat he poses to the Roman administration under Pontius Pilate, the Gospel of Mark inserts this conversation about love. Jesus came to reveal God's love for every human being. And as I was listening to Nicolette's children's sermon, I thought, do I need to start removing pages from my sermon? I feel like you already preached some of this message. So thank you. Jesus preached justice, and he fed hungry people, and he brought healing with his words and his actions. His parables, his teachings, his arguments got at the heart of the matter. That practicing love for God and love for our neighbors is the way that we experience the promises that God has made in a broken and fearful world right now, today. Sometimes, though, it can feel like the kingdom of God is far off. Over the past year, I've been reading some of the writing and the speeches that Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy has made when he talks about, quote, an epidemic of loneliness in America. The pandemic has exacerbated this crisis, but COVID was not its cause. According to a study released by Health and Human Services in 2023, and I quote, the rate of loneliness among young adults has increased every year between 1976 and 2019, end quote. A Surgeon General's advisory on loneliness as an epidemic observes, quote, although risk may differ across indicators of social disconnection or loneliness, currently studies find the highest prevalence for loneliness and isolation among people with 
poor physical or mental health, disabilities, financial insecurity, those who live alone, single parents, as well as young and older populations. End quote. Loneliness has been a challenge that we have faced as campus ministers working with students for more than 12 years. For young people who have lived through a pandemic and also live with a disability, the challenge of social disconnection and a demanding academic schedule can be acute. Many of our students are also people of color, many are international students, and some are the first members of their families to attend college. Some of them are struggling with their mental health. That loneliness can compound into mental health crises, feelings of despair. In a world that desperately needs connection and community, Jesus reminds us that love is the root of life with God. Love builds trust so that a community and its members can speak what's on their heart and know that they will be heard and respected. Love shows generosity to the people that you know well, and it shows hospitality to strangers no matter who they are or where they come from, just like Nicolette said. Love is more than a feeling or an idea, but a way of talking with and treating one another by which we continue growing into the beloved community that Jesus asks us to become. Every Sunday during the academic year, we worship with about 40 undergrad and graduate students at a service called Breaking Bread. We sing hymns together, we pray for one another, we hear a short sermon, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, just like we're doing this morning. Thanks to support from the Presbytery of the Coastlands, we are able to host a fellowship meal after worship each week. When we get together around food, and maybe you do the same, we laugh at each other's stories, we eat something delicious, and we share about what's been tough that week. We grow together in understanding how deep God's love is for us through the love that we share for one another. These things are connected. When we worship together and show our love for God, and we eat together and we share this meal and love one another, we are strengthened in our life together. The students who have led the community I serve, Princeton Presbyterians, have been showing that love for God and neighbor through their lives and work. I think about Jonathan, who graduated a couple years ago and is studying to be a doctor. He spent his college summers working at a harm reduction clinic in Philadelphia with people struggling with addiction. David and Avery have devoted afternoons at a program called El Centro, teaching ESL classes to folks who have newly arrived in this country and are our neighbors living in our town and the next towns over. When a classmate's mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer, grad students Mike and Molly regularly brought meals to her apartment, checked in on her, and celebrated her, dinner, her graduation with a dinner out. We believe that these small things, these day-to-day -day rhythms, are ways that the kingdom of God is showing up in the love these students have for each other and for their neighborhood. I want to tell you that students are a part of God's unfolding story of good news here in Coastlands Presbytery, beyond the bounds of Princeton. In August 2023, we planted a new ministry at the College of New Jersey with our colleague Rosa Ross that's called UKirk Ewing. And people always ask me, UKirk, what is that? It's a word that the Presbyterian Church came up with for university and kirk, which is an old Scottish word for church. So, you, Kirk. Okay. Not my favorite branding, but we're going with it, right? <laughs> and then Ewing, because we not only serve the campus of TCNJ, but we see ourselves as a part of the wider neighborhood of the city of Ewing. Rosa gathers about 15 students for Bible study, for one-on-one -on -one meetings at Starbucks this time, not Small World, worship services every other week, and regular fellowship dinners. She's partnered closely with local Presbyterian congregations, Ewing Covenant and West Trenton, 
and they hold conversations together about faith and life. They just finished up a series talking about how do we love one another in a tense election season. This followed on what can the songs of Dolly Parton teach us about living the Christian life. I'm here for both of them. I'm game for both of them. My wife's from East Tennessee. I don't know if y'all are Dolly fans, but in my house, there's a lot of Dolly Parton playing. You know. <laughs> These students, through their fellowship and the partnerships with local congregations, have made meaningful connections with churches that are majority older members. Some students have joined UN Covenant in the past year, and one student named Prim was baptized last spring. Again, an epidemic of loneliness in America. How do we work through this together? Bringing young people and older generations around tables together to love one another, to share their stories, to care for each other, to eat something delicious with one another. When it feels like loneliness and division rule the day, we believe this is a time of renewal in our Presbyterian. This model of partnering with local congregations and college students deepens our collective love for God and neighbor. When the presbytery and congregations support a ministry like you, Kirk Ewing at TCNJ, these students know and feel the love of God that's being shared by you, the wider body of Christ. Many of these students are from New Jersey, and many of them stay in New Jersey after graduation. When they youth group and go to college, we want to welcome them into a community that sees and celebrates them just as they are during their student years. But then it turns in the other direction, because when they graduate and live beyond graduation as followers of Jesus, we hope that they will get connected with churches like you and that they will participate in the ways you are living out the gospel here in New Jersey as well. For this reason, we're trying to expand our presence at TCNJ, and we're trying to discern together what it looks like in a few years to branch out to schools like Ryder University, Mercer County Community College, and beyond. We believe that this mutual love and shared ministry connects college students to the church, and it connects the church to a new generation of Christian servant leaders. We cannot do this alone. Campus ministry thrives with time, committed leaders, funding, and most of all, lots of love. It's work that flourishes when student leadership teams get together with local congregations and the Presbytery's wholehearted support. Won't you join us in thinking about and considering what it looks like to join in this work Jesus has called us to live out on campuses and in towns all around us. It might be the case that loving college students is one way that we find ourselves drawing near to the kingdom of God that Jesus promises. Amen. Friends, we continue in worship by singing together, and so I invite you to stand as we join in worship.
please be seated. Whenever I'm a guest leader in worship, I love to surprise people. So I've uh, <laughs> very intentionally put the song after the hymn after the offering. So no, um, I apologize. But uh, we come when we come together in worship. We offer everything that we have to our God, and God asks not only our hearts and minds, but from what we have uh, as resources as well. And so we give at this time, uh, in this moment of offering, to further the work that God would have us do in the world as partners in mission in our neighborhoods and in this country and around the world. Would the ushers please come forward to receive this morning's offering? Friends, let's pray. Loving God, we dedicate these gifts to your work and ask that you would inspire us to be creative and generous in what you would have us do, loving, your na loving our neighbors throughout the world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. When I was talking with Pastor Kyle about getting ready to come and things I should expect for the worship service, he told me about how there would be canned and dry goods here at the table. And I think that that is such a lovely sign of how what happens here at the table is that we remember God's love for us in Jesus Christ. And this food extends out, and that love goes outward into the world around us. What we do here at the table has meaning in how we live our lives throughout the week until we come back here to worship God again. And so we come to this table remembering God's grace that has been revealed in Jesus Christ. And it is that same risen Christ who in the book of Revelation says to his disciples, listen, I stand at the door knocking. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. With that in mind, let us come together and share in the feast Christ has prepared. I would like to invite those who are serving our elders and deacons to come forward as we uh, begin to share in this feast. And beloved, we remember that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Friends, together we remember the body of Christ broken for you. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray together. Loving God, we trust that whenever we come together and we pour this cup and we break this bread, that you and your Holy Spirit are feeding us. That as we share 
in this bread and cup that you are spiritually making us new and you are knitting us together as members of the body of Christ. We give you thanks that we are able to gather here and worship you this morning with our songs, with our prayers, hearing your word. We ask that you would watch over us as we go to our various lives and the challenges that we face, loved ones who are facing illness, struggles at our jobs or in our homes, we know that there are all kinds of things that are troubled. But we know that we are a part of the story that you are telling. And it is a story that ends as good news. And so, we take strength from this meal. We ask for the gift of perseverance in your spirit. And in all that we say and do, we ask that we would bear witness to the love of God that has been revealed in Christ Jesus. We gather these prayers together using the language that's closest to our hearts, saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let's join together in praising God by singing, Great Are You, Lord. Please stand.
Friends, go out into this day in peace to love and to serve the Lord with a deep and abiding joy. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless and keep you now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, what a pleasure to be here.